Um, so you might not just want to rely on a lot of text online and blogs and reflections. How can you, how can you have some options? So I have case A and case B. You see, so if students don't like case A, they do case B. I have, the first time I taught adults online, I had four assignments and they hated me for it. Second time I had 10, pick any four and they love me for it. You see, variety, you can do. You don't have to, once the 10 assignments are created, you use them next time and the next time. It takes you no extra time and the resources are there. Then in the variety, we get autonomy. So that goes back to this issue of choice, autonomy. So the A word is you know, really about giving students empowerment over their learning. So having a suite of options, having a kind of a scaffold that learning, having a, a menu of possibilities, and then they pick and choose what they want to accomplish within the class that makes uh, reason. Like I had a visually impaired student, and it was going to be difficult for her to do a YouTube video in the class. But what she could do is a set of blog posts, so she's very good at typing, see? So taking into account their, their special needs, in effect, and their preferences, not learning styles, but preferences. So then the R gets that relevance, meaningful. It goes back again to finding activities that relate back to the content. In, in anthropology and archaeology classes, having them go to online virtual archaeological digs and digging up data. You see, like it's that relevance. In business classes, having people not just do Harvard business cases anymore, but having them solve cases of real problems in business that someone has posted to the web, real case issues or problems, or downloading real world data, Google or, uh, or Vodafone or Verizon, and uh, analyze it in an accounting class. So meaningful, authentic, or, or if they're doing a practicum or an internship, having them do reflections on what they see in a school on an internship or in a social work situation or in a you know, psychologist's uh, office or a counselor or whatever. Um, so meaningful relevance. So that's, that's I guess, that VAR. Now the I is interactivity. So having students collaborate with others in another country, for instance. My students work with students from Malaysia in solving case problems. My students work with students from the University of Houston in writing wiki books. So interactivity. You don't want them just doing their own work and being done, but talk about it. Discuss that in a threaded discussion forum. I have a starter wrapper activity. Everybody in the semester signs up to be a starter once and a wrapper once. The starter starts the discussion, reads ahead. I don't lecture, they're lecturing to each other, you see. So starter, wrapper, interactivity. Then the, we get at the E word. So we had an earlier E word, which got at encouragement. Now we get at engagement. How do we engage them in that learning process? How do we get them excited about learning? Um, again, a lot of these previous things that we talked about earlier, uh, but we also want in, uh, in, in engaging collaborative kinds of environments. Uh, again, going back to flexibility, choice, relevance, meaningful, all these get at this notion of, of making the learner more in, engaged, requiring things to do. Don't make them all optional, but having some you know, uh, ways of monitoring their work, having drafts do of work, not just the final project because students procrastinate online, that's a big issue. So engagement. Then tension. Tension you can do through debates and role play. Piaget talked about having dissonance in a class, you know, having some sense that I don't know something. So bringing in alternative perspectives, bringing in diversity, having them watch a YouTube video on stem cell research and the controversies about it and then debating it. Or the Human Bodies exhibit that's traveling the world is sort of a debatable thing whether we should have this kind of thing. I have my students enroll in my classes. I enroll Mahatma Gandhi and Mother Teresa and my students can role play these people and we can have some, you know, some interesting interactions when they become these people. So tension, having some post, somebody be the, um, we can call it the confederate, but be the, the um, we can also call it the devil's advocate and, and creating that tension. And finally, yielding products, the, the, the last letter of variety, why. So we want a final product that students can um, post to the web in a gallery of the students' best work. And if you post it to the web, you can keep posting the better and better stuff so your standards go up. Instead of worrying about the standards going down, you can actually go up. It's very important, I think, to have students build something that can be shared with an audience beyond the teacher. And the web allows that, to have experts come in and rate, to have their peers see it, to have previous students come back. I've had previous students say, I don't want to leave this class. I'm going to come back and give some feedbacks. So that product at the end becomes something they can take at Thanksgiving and share with their grandparents, 
uh, or at Christmas, I can go here and look at my project, you see. So this is the tech variety model of online motivation and retention, R2D2 model of empowering online learning. Those are frameworks. And I think that if you have a framework and you can develop your own, it becomes easier to teach online. In 1996, I wrote an article on 10 ways to teach creatively, 10 ways to think critically online, and 10 ways to collaborate. And in 97, I got asked to teach online. I went back to the article and used those ideas. So I think my point is, look at some of these book resources and other things with frameworks, but find the things that work for you. Create a vision or a plan and then map those things out that can thoughtfully be integrated into a class. Don't just use them because they sound cute or nice or whatever. Use them because they make sense. Um, and try things small, short, uh, low risk, low cost, low time, that are you know, going to be high payoff at the same time. And then move on to something that might be more difficult, you see, in nature. Start with successes, both for you and your students, and you'd be much more happy. And keep reflecting on what works, sharing it with your, your department. If you share, you create a community where people are doing things online, and you become more, um, I guess, a professional community of online uh, educators, if you will. So that's some of the advice I have for you. Um, models and frameworks with what I focused on here. I'm happy to talk to anyone else about these things. Send me an email at cjbonk at indiana.edu. My name's Kurt Bonk from Indiana University, and thank you very much for inviting me in to talk to you here in Hawaii. Mahalo. <laughs>